This is a video on wildlife photography tips for the beginners and really the importance of backgrounds in wildlife photography. When I go out to photograph wildlife, whether I'm photographing opportunistically or I'm scouting looking for new locations for wildlife, one of the first things I look at is backgrounds. So in this video we're going to dive into why backgrounds are such an important element for wildlife photography and give some tips and tricks for improving our backgrounds and making our images even stronger. The background should complement the subject and it shouldn't distract from it. One of the easiest ways to do this, and probably one of the most popular ways amongst wildlife photographers, is to leave the background as a completely kind of blurred out bokeh with no distracting elements in it whatsoever. So first, we'll dive into how to achieve that blurred out bokeh effect for wildlife photography. But after that, we'll also dive into, is that blurred out background what we always want to achieve? I don't think it is, but let's dive into that a little bit later. First off, I want to give a big shout out to all my Patreons who support me. Uh, without you guys, I probably would not be able to come out with all these videos. So thank you so much. And in this video, I'm going to be sharing some of my Patreon's images on the Patreon site. We do an ongoing challenge for wildlife photography, simplifying the process, working on a step each time. So right now, we've been working on backgrounds, and I have some great images to share from my Patreons. We'll be doing that in this video. I'll be leaving the rest of the video ad-free. And you can thank my Patreons for that by, you know, giving them a follow. I think there are four main elements to help us achieve that blurred out background that we might be looking for. There are a few more tips and tricks that can help and I'll give those throughout the video. Now out of these four, two of them are kind of what I would call costly, it's about gear, and two of them are free and it's more about field skills. The gear we want to have to help us achieve that blurred out background in wildlife photography, we want the longest possible telephoto lens we we can get. The longer the telephoto lens, the easier it is to blur out that background. The other thing is a low f-stop. So if you have an f-stop of f2.8 or f4, it's going to be easier to blur out the background than if your lowest f-stop is 5.6. Those two steps are about gear and they're kind of costly, but that doesn't mean that we can't get a blurred out background without having to spend loads of money. The other two elements we need to keep in mind are free and they're about field skills. One of them is getting as close to the subject as possible, and the other one is choosing a background that is as far away from the subject as possible further away, the better. There's a rough guide in the Handbook of Bird Photography that says that you want to pick a background that is twice the distance as you to the subject. Now this is a rough rule and I think it works in a lot of cases, but it is a little bit dependent on what kind of gear you have. But I think that's a really good rule to keep in mind when you see an animal or you want to set up something for later. It's a good idea to see, can I get so close to the subject that the background is twice the f as far as that or more, preferably more. Uh, that is a really good book by the way and I highly recommend it. It's probably 10 years old now but it's packed full with tips for some of the best bird photographers in the world. A cloudy day with diffuse light can really help smooth out that background. It will be less contrast in the background. It'll be easier to create that nice smooth background. Now, for animals that are low to the ground, you want to get yourself down to the ground as well. So you're photographing at eye level because if you're photographing down at them, the background becomes the ground which is right behind the animal. So do remember, you want to keep that background at least two times the distance as you are from the animal. Look out for mosaic backgrounds. If there's a lot of different textures and patterns in the background in a small compressed area, it's going to be harder to have a smooth background. Those things are going to stick out. And especially if you're setting up for a hide or something like that, you're going to spend a long time in a hide then, you know, get down to the ground, take test shots, focus on where you think the subject's going to be, and then check your background. It's so easy to have something bright or distracting in the background that you don't see when you're out there doing the recce. I've done this before. Uh, I've done this with barnacle geese, and I was in a hide uh, photographing barnacle geese in this little pond, and I had these very bright branches in the background. Well, luckily, it was kind of, it was a bigger area, so I could follow them around, and I could, every now and then I could get a better background. But so important to pick those backgrounds wisely when you're setting up a hide.
Now, one of the reasons why a longer telephoto works well is that you compress the image. You pick a back on this over a smaller part. I was photographing a chiff chaff up on a gorse and I could really pick my backgrounds. And if you look at this image here, you can see that there are so many different elements that I could pick from my background. And that's exactly what I did. I chose part of it, I chose part sky, I chose some mountains in the distance, I chose uh, the waters, I got a bit of blue in there, I chose green field, I chose conifer trees, and all this by just moving a little bit here and a little bit there. And the long telephoto lens then meant that it's easier to pick out a small area of background. So then we're going to dive into high key and low key images. These are very popular amongst wildlife photographers. So a low key image is a very dark image. A high key image is a very bright image. We do it by overexposing and underexposing. An easy way to create a low key image is if you have light directly on, for instance, a bird in a pond, but the background is left in shade. Well, you can expose for the bird and you can leave that shaded background into a blackness of nothing. And that means that that, that bird is really going to pop. Now, one of my patrons, Barry, he did that here very effectively with a swan and a dark background. One of the things that's really good about this is that the background doesn't matter so much then. It can be a cluttered background, it can be right behind the subject, but if you leave that into darkness, you won't see it in the final image anyway. So your bird is really gonna pop in the frame. high key image, a very bright image. So you have, maybe you have clouds in the background, maybe you have water in the background, something very bright. So the idea about a high key image is that you overexpose, leave, lose all detail around the animal, but you leave detail in the animal or parts of the animal. There's some really cool and interesting results with this. I used this technique recently. I was up on the hills and I photographed a snow bunting and I overexposed my image so that I lost detail all around it. Now one of the great tools for high key and low key images is in post-processing and if you can't get it exactly right in the field, you can dodge and burn in post-processing. You know, if you're making a high key image, you can use a brush to brighten even more of the background. Or on the other side, if you're making a low key image, you can use a brush to darken even more of the background if it's still visible. If you're a beginner wildlife photographer and you aren't taking images where you're blurring out that background yet, I would focus on that and try and really get those kind of images where your subject just pops in the frame and you leave that background nice and out of focus. But then we have to ask ourselves, is that all we want our wildlife photography to be? Do we want every image just to be out of focus background and all attention on the subject? I don't think it is. In fact, some of my favorite images of wildlife photography is actually when you include a little bit of the background, showing a bit more of the habitat and environment that the animal lives in. Now, a lot of people may think that that is easier to do because all you need to do then is just press the shutter, take, take a photo of the animal and include the background, but that is not the case. We need to do it in a nice and pleasing way. It still needs to not distract from the subject. It needs to complement the subject. That showing part of the habitat in the background goes from anywhere from having it slightly out of focus where you get a hint of what's in the back to a complete tack sharp image throughout. The more sharpness you have throughout the photo, I would say that it's probably more and more difficult to create a great image. Important thing to keep in mind here is composition. You want to align the background subjects it complements and using compositional rules. You really don't want to make it distracting. You definitely don't want a branch going through, you know, the head or the body of the animal that you're photographing. The way to create these kind of images is to spend a lot of time taking these kind of images, spending a lot of time in the field, practicing it, learning compositional rules, knowing when to break the rules. Now, one of my favorite ways is to look at great wildlife photographers. There are some great wildlife photographers on Instagram who actually post great wildlife photography on Instagram. But unfortunately, a lot of people on Instagram post for likes and follows, so it, it, isn't, it isn't always the best way to go learn about wildlife photography. I would highly recommend picking up a book like Bird Photographer of the Year and really starting to pay attention to the backgrounds they use and the compositions they use in those kind of books, because they are some of the best in the world. I really like to try and show a little bit more of the habitat that the animal is living in and try to do that with a slightly out of focus but still get the textures of the habitat and environment they live in.
uh, for really creating something different and interesting in your backgrounds, the only thing that's going to limit you is your imagination. Just as a couple of interesting ways to get you started, uh, one of the things that can be really effective is to use out of focus these kind of bokeh balls. And you're looking for reflected lights. I was reading an interesting blog post the other day that called this looking for the sparkle spots. Very often you get this from water reflections. So having water in your background, having light pass through that water and leaving that water out of focus as your background with a low f-stop will very often give you these awesome little bokeh balls and some people like it, some people don't. I personally, I love them. You know, if they're done right, they can be really effective and can really create some cool results. I would experiment with looking for the sparkle spots and using them in my background. Here's a great result of a dipper from one of my Patreons using those sparkle spots in the background. Another way to create something similar is for instance, here in the woodland, you look at these little opening of lights coming through the leaves in the background. And you try and get them out of focus to create some cool bokeh balls in the background. If you want to check out my Patreon, I really appreciate it. We have ongoing challenges like this to really learn the fundamentals of wildlife photography and then we'll bring it up and up and become more and more advanced as we go. We also have a live group called Check In every other month. Uh, to just to see how we're getting on and you know support support each other in the wildlife photography journey so if you want to check it out i'll leave a link below and thank you guys so much for watching i'll catch you next time